Thank you. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Deputy First Minister what engagement he has planned for the rest of the day. Deputy First Minister. Presiding Officer, the First Minister is in London today at the unveiling by Her Majesty the Queen of a memorial to commemorate those who have served in recent international conflicts. She has asked that I respond to questions on her behalf. Later today, I will have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding Officer, in the 2014 independence referendum, did the Scottish Government consider oil as just a bonus or as the basis of the Scottish economy? Deputy First Minister. Well, certainly I consider oil to be a big bonus. Yes. Um, it's certainly been a huge bonus for the United Kingdom. It's been £300 billion worth of revenues for the United Kingdom. And of course, I'm not the only person that thought it was a bonus. In 2014, the Prime Minister came to Aberdeen and he said that there would be, if Scots voted no, a £200 billion oil boom bonus for, the, for Scotland if Scotland voted no in the referendum. So what I would say to Ruth Davidson is, yes, oil is a bonus and it's propped up the United Kingdom economy for many years. Ruth Davidson. The Deputy First Minister is sticking to the line that oil is a bonus and not the basis for the Scottish economy. It's the one that's going to make every single person in Scotland richer if we're independent in the way he tried to sell it just three years ago. Yet this week, this week, we had Andrew Wilson, the head of the SNP's Growth Commission, finally exposing the truth. He admitted we did have oil baked into the numbers and it was indeed a basis. In other words, the entire economic prospectus on which the SNP based its entire case for independence was bogus. It's a simple question now, Deputy First Minister. Is Andrew Wilson right? Deputy First Minister. Well, I've, ex I've explained to Ruth Davidson already the importance of uh, oil to the United Kingdom economy and the huge bonus it has been to the UK over these 40 years. And, of course, the Prime Minister... He was here in Scotland in 2014 saying there would be a massive oil bonus uh, for Scotland if we voted no. And of course, there were, other promises, there were other promises made to Scotland if we voted no. The same day that the Prime Minister vote, uh, suggested there'd be a £200 billion oil bonus, he said to people in the north-east of Scotland, vote no and there'd be a billion pound carbon capture project for Peterhead. That's that's been, that's been cancelled, presiding officer. And then, of course, there was the other almighty commitment of the no campaign, vote no to stay in the European Union. Oil, carbon capture, European Union, the no campaign was shattered by these broken promises. Ruth Davidson. The question was about John Swinney's oil claims being taken apart by his own side. No wonder that aspect was the one aspect he didn't want to talk about. Of course, we all know what's happened since the Deputy First Minister was talking about all of our big bonuses. Oil receipts have absolutely collapsed. And there's a, a simple question that people across Scotland now have. And the question is this. Without those oil receipts, can the Deputy First Minister point to any independent analysis that shows that Scotland's economy would fare better right now if we were outside the United Kingdom? Deputy First Minister. Well, I think what people in Scotland would want to hear is more action... <laughs> ..is more action to support the North Sea oil and gas sector. And that's what this government has been arguing for, what the Finance Secretary has been arguing for, and what the UK government has been doing is talking about possibly setting up a talking shop which they talked about setting up a year ago and it hasn't even materialised yet. And of course, we know why the Tories are not interested in supporting the oil and gas sector. Their spokesman, Alec Burnett, let it, the cat out of the bag. He argued there should be no measures taken to support oil and gas in Scotland. Now, we know that, 
we know that Mr Burnett is a bit poor at declaring his own interests, but he's certainly bad at standing up for the interests of the North East of Scotland. So, at a time, at a time, when the onshore productivity of Scotland is increasing at four times the rate of the rest of the United Kingdom, which the Chancellor cited in his budget statement yesterday, I think there's grounds for a great deal of optimism about the strength of the Scottish economy. Ruth Davison. Officer, I have the response from the oil and gas industry here to yesterday's budget. We welcome the Chancellor's response to our call to maximise recovery of the remaining UK oil and gas reserves. The oil and gas industry can welcome the moves from the UK Government. It's no surprise that the Scottish Government don't because they do nothing for the North East of Scotland. No. People at home will have noticed the Deputy First Minister didn't answer the question. And it's a shame, a real shame, that there is nobody on the SNP front bench who's prepared to be as upfront as Mr Wilson is on the radio. This morning, we had the First Minister gunning for a referendum on independence next year. She called it common sense. I call it nonsense because most people in Scotland do not want it. Most Scots don't want to go back to the division and uncertainty of another independence referendum. Most Scots think it's irresponsible to talk of a second referendum which is only going to damage the Scottish economy yet further. That is common sense and why does the Deputy First Minister not listen to them? Deputy First Minister. So, no, sir, on the substance of action to help the North Sea oil and gas sector in the North East of Scotland, let me set out for Ruth Davidson three things that this government has done in the recent past. The First Minister launched a decommissioning challenge fund to support the development of the supply chain to tackle oil and gas decommissioning. We launched, secondly, a, mil a £12 million transition training fund to support individuals to retain their skills within the sector. And thirdly, the Energy Jobs Task Force has remained focused on supporting those affected by the downturn in the oil and gas sector and will remain so in the years to come. So that's the concrete action we've taken to support the North East of Scotland and the oil and gas sector. Now, it's interesting that Ruth Davidson moves on to the question of the Constitution. And no wonder, because it's been, it's been, it's been very topical today. Because today, today we've seen an opinion poll published just before question time, which shows support for the, in, the, the constitutional question on independence at 50-50 in Scotland. So what that says to me, and we shouldn't, be surprised, we shouldn't be at all surprised by those numbers, because that's the people of Scotland being exposed to the hard right politics of the Tory party, seeing the mess they're getting us into about Europe and deciding that it's time for this country to choose its own future. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Deputy First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the week. Deputy First Minister. Uh, I'll have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Before the independence referendum, John Swinney said, the early years of an independent Scotland are time to coincide with a massive North Sea oil boom. Order. But yesterday, but yesterday, Order. the Office of Budget Responsibility confirmed that North Sea oil and gas actually cost the Treasury money last year. So can the Deputy First Minister tell us, why didn't the SNP tell the people of Scotland the truth about oil? Deputy First Minister. Isn't it revealing that at the first, the first available opportunity, they've come back together again? It's, oh, it's like... It's like they've never had a moment apart. Thought, I would have thought after the calamity that Kezia Dugdale led the Labour Party into in the 2016 election, she might have learnt to have nothing to do with that law over there.
Casey, a drug deal. Presiding officer. Please, can we have a little bit? Excuse me. Can we have a little bit of order, please, and slightly less applause? Kezia Dugdale. Presiding officer, the Deputy First Minister can shout and scream and clap all he likes about Better Together alliances, but he cannot escape the reality of his own words. Own and words. here are some more. Same as me. It is clear that future tax receipts from North Sea oil and gas will be substantial and represent a significant resource for the people of Scotland. And the reality, presiding officer, is this. People in Scotland were given false hope by the SNP based on a false prospectus. They were told that we could only build a fairer country with independence. But now we know beyond all doubt that that just wasn't true. New analysis published by Labour Today reveals that the SNP's there is, well, <laughs> there is, excuse me, there is too much noise in the chamber today. Kezia Dugdale. They'll be laughing when they realise it's based on their own numbers, their own record. The SNP's estimate for oil revenues in what would have been the first two years of an independent Scotland could be out as as much as £21 billion. In old money, presiding officer, that's £21,000 million. That would deliver turbocharged austerity and it would have made that fairer nation all but impossible to build. Does the Deputy First Minister feel any guilt about offering the people of Scotland such false hope. Deputy First Minister. If we're, going to, if we're going to pass around this chamber accusations about guilt, I think the Labour Party has got to think long and hard about how they've enabled the Tory party to govern the United Kingdom because of their awful stance in the referendum in 2014, which ushered in a Tory government that has taken us out of the European Union, that's punishing vulnerable individuals in our society and damaging the life chances of individuals. The Tory budget yesterday is assessed by the Resolution Foundation to be consigning people in this country to the lowest level of wage growth in over 200 years. That's what the Labour Party are guilty of ushering in by their stance in the referendum. In the midst of that rant, the truth John Swinney can't escape from is that the economic case for independence is well and truly bust. And we all remember... We all remember... We all remember his Order. newspaper. Order. Order. Excuse me. Will the chamber please settle down? There are too many interruptions. There is too much applause, too much shouting. Will you please listen to the questions and listen to the answers? Kezia Dugdale. Excuse me. Please. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. We all remember the leaked paper, presiding officer. That was the one where John Smith, uh, Swinney admitted privately that the sums didn't add up. The oil revenues were volatile and that pensions would be at risk under independence. Nicola Sturgeon has again today backed herself into a corner on a second independence referendum. Maybe the Deputy First Minister can apply some common sense to help her get out of it. He has looked at the numbers. He knows the case for independence lies in tatters. So why won't he scrap the plans for a second independence referendum? Deputy First Minister. I say to Kezia Dugdale that the Labour Party, if they want to progress, have got to learn the lessons of the mistakes that they made in 2014. And the arguments and the narrative and the explanation that Kezia Dugdale is coming out with today, her entire line of attack could have been delivered by Ruth Davidson. It's almost as if Kezia Dugdale wandered into the Scottish Exhibition Centre last weekend and listened to the speeches by Theresa May and Ruth Davidson and came to this parliament to deliver them to members of parliament. I've got some helpful advice to the Labour Party. 
get onto Scotland's side and then you might progress. There's some constituency supplementaries. The first from Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister may be aware that First Pass is pulling out of all services across borders and Midlothian in my constituency. I have already written to the Transport Minister and had a lengthy conversation with the Commercial Director of West Coast Motors, which will be taking over as of 25 March. A further meeting is already pencilled in. There are 113 employees across that piece, and while TUPE does apply, and while I am hopeful the change in provider will be good news, can I ask what reassurance the Deputy First Minister can give to my constituents, both employees and passengers, about their jobs and their rural bus services, which are so vital? Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, I, I acknowledge the, the significance of the issue that Christine Graham raises, and we are aware of the proposed sale of First Scotland East Borders operation to West Coast Motors. Uh, the proposed deal will, of course, be a commercial transaction, as the member will know, but we are engaging with the operators and also with the relevant local authorities to understand the situation and any implications for the staff and the travelling public. Um, we welcome the assurances that have been given by FIRST that all jobs, pay and conditions will be protected. Uh, the Minister for Transport will be speaking with the Managing Director of FIRST Scotland East next week to discuss the issue and we will consult publicly on measures in the Transport Bill later this year to address some of the issues that are raised. And, of course, the Transport Minister would be happy to have further discussions with Christine Graham uh, and other interested members, if that would be helpful. Graham Simpson. My constituent, Mrs Norma Henderson, who lives in Airdrie, requires an operation for a very serious and worsening gynaecological condition. She's aged 61 and is the primary carer for her disabled daughter. She first went to see her GP in August. Since then, her treatment, if it can be called that, has been woeful. She's had two provisional operation dates cancelled. The 12-week Scottish NHS guarantee for treatment was reached on February the 13th without her having had an operation. She was then given another provisional date for this month. That has been and gone. Would the Deputy First Minister like to apologise to Mrs Henderson yes. and what can he say to assure her that this ongoing disgrace will not continue? Deputy First Minister. First of all, I'd say to uh, Mr Simpson um, and directly to Mrs Henderson as well that the National Health Service um, undertakes a, a huge volume of clinical activity on a daily basis and members of staff around the country work extremely hard to put in place the services that uh, are designed to address and to, uh, to the, the needs of patients and to support them. And I recognise uh, the particular circumstances that uh, Mr Simpson raises because Mrs Henderson is a primary carer for her daughter and that is uh, obviously we must do all we can to try to support in this circumstance. Um, we have seen data published uh, just uh, the, during this week about the level of cancelled operations, which shows that the, um, the, the level of cancelled operations uh, for uh, non-clinical reasons is uh, just 2.5 per cent. So the, 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 there is a huge 97.5% of operations go ahead as planned. Now obviously, we'll look at the specific issues that Mr Simpson raises about this case. Um, if he would care to uh, pass those to the Health Secretary, they will be looked at immediately uh, to determine the circumstances. And the Health Secretary will be happy to meet with Mr Simpson to address any issues that come out of that analysis. And Gordon MacDonald. Staff at Heriot Watt University in my constituency are concerned about the sudden announcement on Friday of 100 job losses. The university stated the move is a direct result of a number of factors, inclu including post-Brexit uncertainty over immigration and research grants leading to a shortfall in postgraduate applications. What assistance can the Deputy First Minister offer my constituents who face an uncertain future? Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, I am aware of the issue and the Minister for Higher Education and Science has discussed uh, these issues with the principal at Heriot Watt University. Uh, as autonomous bodies, universities are responsible for their own finances and staffing. However, I would expect the university to work closely with staff and unions on this matter, and it is absolutely vital that student experience is not diminished. 
Uh, from my discussions across the sector and the discussions of the, the Minister for Higher Education and Science across the sector, we uh, are acutely aware of the unease within the higher education sector about the implications of Brexit. Um, any member listening to the concerns of the higher education sector could not fail uh, to see and to recognise those concerns. Uh, for the government's part, uh, the Scottish Funding Council has um, increased the resources that are available to Heriot Watt University for the forthcoming academic year, uh, and that is welcome. Uh, but of course, the university is wrestling with significant uncertainty around the position on EU citizens. And I would encourage the United Kingdom government to provide clarity on the ability of EU citizens and students from across the globe to study at one of Scotland's um, uh, universities in the future. And we hope that further reassurance can be given by the Chancellor to our excellent universities so they can maintain the income that they draw from competitive EU research funds, which are central uh, to the strengthening of our university sector. Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Deputy First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. Deputy First Minister. It, the Cabinet will next meet on Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. Given the volume in the Chamber a few minutes ago as the other political parties debated their shared, desperate attachment to the economics of the fossil fuel industry, it's possible that people might find it hard to believe that the parties are about to stand together later this afternoon to promote Earth Hour, demonstrating a claimed shared commitment to action on climate change. Yet over recent weeks, parliamentary scrutiny of the government's draft climate plan has exposed serious omissions and contradictions. We've seen the Environment Secretary defending a plan that includes nothing to improve bus use and saying that car journeys are destined to go up by 25%, while the Transport Minister says, no, that's only the worst case scenario. We've had the Environment Secretary telling the Chamber about a government policy for compulsory soil testing to reduce fertiliser use, and a fortnight later, the Rural Economy Secretary writes to committees to say, no, that's definitely not happening. And although the Finance Secretary uh, admits that there's been no attempt to build a credible economic case for his plan to cut aviation tax. He tells us that the rest of the economy can make up for the extra emissions from all that flying, even though the climate plan itself is utterly devoid of detail on how this is to happen. The draft climate plan is barely half-baked. Isn't it clear that major changes are needed if we're going to ensure that the ambitious choices Scotland needs to make are actually written into the plan? Deputy First Minister. Officer, first of all, the, uh, the government uh, committed to publish a climate change plan um, in 2016-17 and the draft plan was published on the 19th of January, as Mr Harvey has said. And of course, the detail that Mr Harvey has gone through, I suppose, is what um, uh, demonstrates the rigorous scrutiny that is exercised on the government by parliamentary committees. And so it should be. And these issues should be properly tested within committee. And my experience on, uh, in interacting with parliamentary committees is that we do have that rigorous interaction. Uh, the government's climate change bill is, uh, contains uh, climate change plan. It takes in a, a huge number of measures and interventions across government uh, to enable us to fulfil the targets that we have uh, set for ourselves. And of course, I would remind Mr Harvey that the, government's, uh, 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 the government has already early achieve the 2020 targets that we put in place for carbon uh, emissions reductions. And that's something that I think we should all as a parliament be proud of because we legislated for that ambitious legislation a number of years ago. And we are now seeing that legislation fulfilled as a consequence of the government's uh, leadership and actions. So there is a process of parliamentary scrutiny to be undertaken. But I would ask Mr Harvey to uh, consider the achievements that have been made so far and to work with the government on taking forward measures that will have a substantive effect in reinforcing the targets in the years to come. Patrick Harvey. Well, the, the low-hanging fruit uh, are pretty thin on the branches now, and I suspect the Parliament is going to need to see far more consistency and detail from the government before this climate plan passes. The four parliamentary committees which have produced reports on the plan, they're due to publish tomorrow. But even looking at the submitted evidence that's already in the public domain and from the questions asked by MSPs, it's very clear that there is serious concern and that changes to this draft plan will need to be equally serious. I will say that the situation is not as bad as it is with the UK government, even if that's setting the bar pretty low. 
The climate change was the elephant in the debating chamber yesterday during the, the budget statement. Not a single mention of climate change by the Chancellor, neither on the challenges that we face nor on the opportunities from the low-carbon economy which the UK government's policies have done so much to undermine. I regret the fact that the Scottish government's criticism of the Chancellor on the North Sea is probably going to be to say that he's not doing enough to support the polluting oil industry uh, to extract fossil fuels that the world can't afford to burn. Can the Deputy First Minister give us one commitment that the extra capital funding that's going to be available will be committed to low carbon infrastructure to help break a reliance on fossil fuel consumption and build up the new industries and genuinely sustainable jobs that the country will need in the post-oil era. Deputy First Minister. I, I'm, I'm very surprised to hear um, Mr Harvey th uh, thinking that uh, my criticism of the Chancellor might be limited to one issue. Uh, I've got lots <laughs> to criticise the Chancellor for. Um, and uh, I, I certainly agree with his analysis that the United Kingdom government has not done all it could have done to help us in advancing the agenda that this Parliament has been interested in advancing, uh, principally on renewable energy. The First Minister was in the Western Isles on Monday <laughs> and reported to Cabinet on Tuesday about the frustration in the Western Isles, about the lack of progress that's been made despite sterling efforts by Fergus Ewing and Paul Wheelhouse over a number of years, to support, support, supported by many, many uh, other uh, parties in Parliament to secure uh, an interconnector that would enable the renewable potential of the Western Isles to be fully realised as a consequence. So I'm quite happy to balance out the criticism to make sure those issues are properly put on the record. And we will work with the United Kingdom government to try to advance. And this is an issue where if the Conservatives have influence with the UK government, they may be able to help us to try to get progress on that interconnector. So an economic opportunity that can really transform the lives and attack fuel poverty in the Western Isles can be realised for the people of, uh, of the Western Isles. Now, Mr Harvey asks me if I will commit the extra capital that was announced by the United Kingdom government yesterday. Now, I have to say to Mr Harvey, times have changed. I no longer control the purse strings in the government. Indeed, I am, I am now a supplicant when it comes to <laughs> entering with trepidation the office of the Finance Secretary to try to secure capital assistance. So, if it's okay with Mr Harvey, I will properly respect the role of the Finance Secretary who will make announcements on these questions to Parliament in due course, but I do commit to putting a good word for Mr Harvey's objectives. <laughs> a couple of further supplementaries. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Audit uh, Scotland report into the failed I-6 project makes grim reading. It's yet another botched IT project on the SNP's watch, which clearly should have been abandon abandoned far sooner. True to form, the Scottish Government's response was to welcome a number of areas of good practice highlighted in the findings, but shamefully ignored the conclusion, which said police officers and staff continue to struggle with out-of-date, inefficient and poorly integrated systems. Yep. Does the Deputy First Minister recognise the difficulties police officers and staff face as a result of this IT shambles? And what reassurance can he give officers and staff who face the prospect of using these worn-out systems for years to come? Deputy First Minister. The first thing I'd say to Mr Ross is that I acknowledge the importance of the, serv the, the system redesign that has got to be undertaken. And that work has to be done. It has to be done in an orderly fashion to make sure that our police services can have access to high quality information technology that can assist them in the work. And the, and the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland are absolutely committed to doing that. Now, I think the best thing for me to do in, in this respect, in answering the points that Mr Ross has made, is to quote the Auditor General for Scotland, who on the radio this morning said that one of the positive things about this particular project is that because of the strength of the contract that Police Scotland had signed with Accenture, they were able to recover both the £11 million they had paid over to their contractor and also to recover an extra £13.5 million to reflect staff time and payments that had been made for hardware and software. Yeah. So in purely cash terms, Police Scotland isn't out of pocket. So that's what the Auditor General for Scotland said this morning in a reflection on the fact that while well, this programme has not been able to, do, to be taken to completion because of the scale of the challenge with the, uh, in, between Police Scotland and the contractor, the public purse has not suffered as a consequence of that. 
and the Police Scotland will now take forward uh, in the way that we would expect them an organised approach to make sure that we can have in place the systems that will enable police officers to have access to modern IT in the period to come. Jackie Bailey. With the substantial reduction in oil revenues, it is surely time for a new oil and gas bulletin. The last publication was June 2015. The First Minister promised me in June 2016 that it would be soon. Frankly, if the Scottish Government was on performance-related pay, they would get nothing. So will the Deputy First Minister ensure that a new bulletin is published before June 2017 and another year passes? Deputy First Minister. If the Labour Party was on performance-related pay, <laughs> goodness, the negative equity. <laughs> they'd be paying back for that IT system that Douglas Ross was talking about. Uh, I can say to Jackie Bailey that the government has published a range of information on oil and gas. Uh, we published a compendium of energy statistics and analysis just last week on the 23rd of February, and I'd encourage Jackie Bailey to take reference of that particular document, which is a substantial compendium of statistical information. Question number four, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the UK budget. Deputy First Minister. Uh, President Officer, the Chancellor's statement confirmed that the Scottish Government faces a £2.9 billion budget cut over the 10 years to 2019-20. While the limited consequentials announced yesterday are welcome, this does not represent an end to austerity. Indeed, recent analysis by the Institute for Fiscal Studies suggests that the UK Government's austerity will continue well into the next decade. The budget provided no support for low-income families who are facing deep cuts to their incomes as a result of the Chancellor's cuts to Social Security and who will bear the brunt of the costs of Brexit. We will continue to do everything we can to boost the economy, tackle inequality and provide high-quality public services. But yesterday's budget does little to support those aims. Liam, sorry, Bruce Crawford. Ian, somebody, but I don't know who it is. <laughs> um, I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Obviously, we all welcome the additional £350 million of funding, albeit over three years, I might add, for the Scottish Budget as a result of the Chancellor's announcement yesterday. But does the Deputy First Minister agree with me? We should not let that blind us, to the, that welcome news blind us to the very real hard reality that Scotland's budget faces a real terms cut of £2.9 billion. As a result of 10 years of Tory government, the people of Scotland did not vote for. Yeah, yeah. A £2.9 billion cut that will do untold damage to the economy, to vital public services, and the, and the cause of equality of Scotland. A Tory government that obviously the Labour Party in Scotland would prefer Absolutely. to Scotland taking control yeah, of their own affairs. Deputy First Minister. President Officer, Mr Crawford makes an important point. Um, UK austerity, uh, as, as Mr Crawford always does, um, UK austerity is cutting the funding available for Scottish public services. Uh, moreover, the UK Government's austerity measures are cutting the incomes of some of the most vulnerable in our society. The latest OBR forecasts show that real average earnings by 2021 will still be below their level in 2007, representing more than a decade of lost growth. And the Treasury's own distributional analysis demonstrates that low-income households will see larger cuts to their incomes than virtually everyone else except for the very richest households, as a direct result of the UK Government's policies over this Parliament. This is the consequence of UK Government policies in Scotland. Yeah. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Chancellor's budget decisions will deliver a welcome additional £145 million in extra Barnet consequentials for next year. Now, given that much of these consequentials arise from money that the Chancellor is allocating to English councils to address business rates rises, how much of the additional money at their disposal will the Scottish Government allocate to councils such as those in the north-east of Scotland who want to set up local rate relief schemes? Deputy First Minister. Well, it's a bit of an odd question because in both Aberdeen City Council and Aberdeen Shire Council, the Conservatives voted against business rates relief schemes that were put forward. Oh so that's, the, that's the, the first odd point about Mr Kerr's question. The second point is that this morning the Conservatives have been arguing for us that this is our opportunity because of the consequentials to cancel the um, removal of the tax cut for high earners. That was Mr. Fraser's property. They're just, 
they're just sitting there cheek by jowl, cheek by jowl, the two of them. Can't, the Conservatives are trying to spend the same money twice. And we all know, we all know, now we know, we all know that the Labour Party used to, when they, maybe, maybe it's something to do with when you sit over there. Because that's what the Labour Party used to ask me to do when I was the finance minister, when they were sitting there in second place, they would ask me to spend the money twice. Now the Tories are the second party and they are asking us to spend the same money twice. The finance secretary will do as he's doing magnificently just now, take decisions that will be sensibly steward the public finances and there'll be wise investments in the future of the Scottish economy. Question number five, Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister for what reason life expectancy is no longer rising in Scotland, increasing in Scotland. Deputy First Minister. Presiding Officer, reducing health inequalities is one of the biggest challenges that we face. They are a symptom of wider economic inequalities, and that is why this Government will continue to take action and has invested £296 million since 2013 to mitigate, to mitigate the harmful effects of the UK Government's welfare reform. It is concerning that between 2012 and 2015, life expectancy rates remained static in Scotland, although we have seen an increase over the year 2015 to 2016. The causes of Scottish mortality are complex, multiple and interwoven. That was the conclusion of the Glasgow Centre for Population Health Landmark Report in 2016. Uh, Danny Dorling, the Professor of Geography at the University of Oxford, said over the weekend that austerity measures may have contributed to the stall in life expectancy, and I quote, I don't think it has anything to do with the SNP government. I think the same thing would have occurred had Labour held power in Scotland. It is the fall in funding due to the financial crash of 2008. Adam Tompkins. Presiding Officer, the Deputy First Minister will know that life expectancy levels in the east end of Glasgow are dramatically lower than in other more affluent parts of the city. The Commonwealth Games offered an unparalleled opportunity to take specific action to reduce health inequalities and mortality rates in the neighbourhoods that hosted the Games, yet it seems that no targets were set to achieve this. Compare this with the boroughs that hosted the Olympics, which set themselves the explicit target of narrowing the gap in male and female life expectancies between the East End and the rest of London. Does the Deputy First Minister not agree that Glasgow should follow London's lead in this regard? And can he tell us what actions Scottish ministers will take to address the health inequalities that persist in Glasgow? Deputy First Minister. Well, I, I think I, I, I reiterate the point that I made in my original answer, that the implications of austerity have increased the challenge that we face in addressing long-term health inequalities that have been pre present in Scottish society for all, all of my lifetime. And the government is taking a, co a coordinated approach to tackling these issues by some of the measures that are taken by uh, Mr. Brown in relation to the regeneration of the East End of Glasgow and the support that we put in place for Clyde Gateway, the work that Shona Robertson takes forward with the health service to make sure that we have an integrated service in areas um, of multiple deprivation to address the whole needs of individuals, not just the health needs, but the whole wellness agenda that is relevant. And the work that I take forward, with particularly measures such as the Pupil Equity Fund, which are designed to target very directly the um, approaches that are required to um, support young people uh, from deprived backgrounds to achieve their potential within our education system. And of course, uh, schools in the East End of Glasgow are benefiting enormously and quite rightly from those investments. And then we have the measures that Angela Constance takes forward uh, as part of the social security work to ensure that we are focusing on supporting the vulnerable in our society. So I reassure Mr Tompkins of the determination of government in Scotland across all of our responsibilities to make sure that we focus on uh, ending the income inequalities that have bedeviled so many individuals in our society and ensure that every individual can have the opportunity uh, to progress in our society uh, despite the, 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 the health difficulties and the background uh, that may have undermined them. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Samaritans report dying from inequality, which suggests that there is an increased risk of suicide in the most deprived communities. Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, any death by suicide is a tragedy, and sadly the link between deprivation and the risk of suicide is well known. 
We will take this, this report's recommendations into account, including placing an emphasis on inequalities as we develop a new suicide prevention strategy for publication early next year. In Scotland, although suicide rates are higher than average in most deprived areas, it is important to recognise that this inequality gap has narrowed over the past decade. Scotland's suicide rates has reduced by 18% in the last 10 years, and the number of suicides in 2015 was the lowest in a single year since 1974. Monica Lennon. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Shortly before the publication of the Samaritans report, we heard from the Minister for mental health in the chamber just last week that there has been no formal evaluation of the last suicide prevention strategy and there appears to be no plan to embark on one before the next strategy is produced. The World Health Organisation tells us that evaluation is a central pillar of effective suicide prevention strategies. Now that we have the Samaritans report, will the Deputy First Minister commit the government to um, an evaluation of the actions in the previous strategy before the government embarks on the next one. Deputy First Minister. I think Monica Lennon raises a, a significant issue. We have to, in policy terms, be very open to questioning whether uh, particular interventions have been successful, given the fact that we all recognise the importance, well, the, the imperative, the necessity of making sure that the measures that we put in place are effective in supporting individuals in, 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 in these circumstances. So, um, if Monica Lennon will forgive me, I won't give her a definitive answer today, but I'll ask the Health Secretary to look closely at the serious point that she has raised, and uh, we will um, reply to Monica Lennon uh, on the very specific point about an evaluation uh, of the strategy. But I do give Parliament the assurance that the government is determined to take all measures we possibly can do to support vulnerable individuals in these circumstances. Question number seven, John Mason. Uh, thank you. To ask the uh, Deputy First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the report by the Chair of the Advisory Group on Tackling Sectarianism in Scotland. Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, I would like to take this opportunity in Parliament to thank Dr Morrow for undertaking this important review. I know that he gathered evidence from a wide range of sources, including all parties in the Chamber, and I would like to thank everyone for their constructive contributions. It is very clear from the review that what remains to be done and that we all have a responsibility to meet this challenge. The Scottish Government is fully committed to building on Dr Morrow's work. We have invested £12.5 million over the last five years to tackle sectarianism, including £9.3 million directly invested in community-based projects across Scotland, uh, more than any public expenditure in this field uh, in advance of this announcement. John Mason. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. Uh, one of the responses that came in to Dr Morrow was from Action of Churches Together in Scotland, which covers a wide number of denominations. Uh, they mentioned the, the concern and the worry that uh, if any changes were made to the Offensive Behaviour at Football etc Act, that could be seen as legitimising sectarianism. Does he share my concern that we must not do anything that would legitimise sectarianism? Deputy First Minister. Uh, well, I, I agree that we must do absolutely nothing to legitimise sectarianism, so it's important that uh, as Parliament considers these issues, the Minister for Community Safety was here making a statement uh, just the other week there about the steps that the Government has, has taken to uh, commission a review into um, uh, all of our um, hate crime legislation to ensure that it is uh, fit for purpose in the period going forward. Um, the, uh, the, the approach that we are determined to take um, is to look for alternatives and to see uh, how the, uh, the measures that uh, are in the Act can be improved. And in line with uh, constructive views offered by the Equality Network, Stonewall and the Law Society of Scotland, um, the uh, independent review of hate crime legislation um, will include uh, an analysis of the Offensive Behaviour Act uh, and that will set out the issues that we have to address in ensuring we have legislation that is fit for the 21st century in Scotland. James Kelly. Thank you. I don't doubt the words of the Deputy First Minister in opposing sectarianism. However, they're undermined slightly by the fact that the government cut funding by £2 million to pr initiatives that were right. uh, fighting uh, sectarianism in their community. I think the, the government's flagship policy in combating sectarianism has been the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. Unfortunately, one of the policy outcomes of that act has been to criminalise young men and introduce many of them for the first time into 
the criminal justice system. I don't think that is consistent with Scottish Government justice policy, and I don't think that was the intention when the Government brought forward the legislation. So will the Deputy First Minister take this opportunity to rethink the approach to this failed legislation and also the Government's overall approach to tackling sectarianism? Deputy First Minister. The, the government has taken steps by the, the measures that we've, uh, we've taken forward to commission the independent review to look at the issues that are raised on sectarianism within the, the whole context of the hate crime legislation within Scotland. And I think that's a, an, a, an open process which should be welcomed across Parliament. In relation to the questions on finance, um, the, the commitments the government has made on uh, tackling sectarianism financially um, has resulted in the investment of £12.5 million pounds over the last five years. That's more than any other government has ever done in the past. Yeah. And that's been a measure of the commitment that we have to ensure that we tackle this issue uh, and tackle it effectively by the support that's in place. And I, I, I appreciate Mr Kelly's strong views on this question, uh, but I, I, and he acknowledges uh, the commitment that I make on this question in, in his own points that he's made. Um, but I ask him to accept that the government is determined to tackle these issues, but to tackle them in a way um, that addresses the wider questions that have to be considered on this important question. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Adam Tompkins. And we'll just take a few moments to change seats.